Welcome back to the Bible Prophecy Timeline series. This is being released as a video and as an audio podcast, both of which are available at my website, BibleProphecyTalk.com. You can also go to my new website, BibleProphecyArchive.com, to download a free 18.5 gigabyte file with audio, video, and articles about Bible prophecy from me and many other teachers, which we have designed to be an offline library of information. I explain all the details about why that project exists and how to use that file at the website BibleProphecyArchive.com. This is part eight of the timeline series, and it's about the mark of the beast. I wanted to do a study of what can be known about the mark of the beast at this point, because this is where we are in the timeline. We are just now after the midpoint of the seven-year period. The Antichrist has just declared himself to be God. He has demanded the worship of the world and has begun the persecution of those who will not worship him. It's in this context that the mark of the beast comes on the scene. Let me first read Revelation 13, 11 through 18, so we can get a bit of context. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This is speaking of the false prophet in context. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. The first beast is the Antichrist. And makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It, the false prophet, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So what I'm going to do is go point by point in this passage to determine what we can know for sure about the mark of the beast, and I'll let you know when we start to get into speculative territory. The first fact about the mark of the beast I see here is that it's the false prophet that makes everyone get the mark of the beast. I think this is important for us because if we look at what the false prophet is doing in context, it really gives us perspective on what is happening in the world at this time. Specifically, we see from verses 13 through 15 that the false prophet can, quote, cause fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. He also has this image of the Antichrist made and is allowed to give it breath so that it speaks and it forces people to worship it. This is all serious stuff. You know, fire down from heaven and stuff like that is stuff you're not likely to miss. And it's stuff that's explicitly stated here in the scriptures. And despite it sounding crazy, it makes perfect sense if it was literally true. This is because the Antichrist is going to present himself as a Messiah. And if he's going to do that, then he is going to need a prophet, specifically one that claims to be Elijah, in order to act like he is fulfilling the very important scriptures in Micah, for example, that Elijah will come before the Messiah. This is a major part of Jewish tradition, even today. They, you know, set out a chair for Elijah. It's a part of the prayer that concludes every Sabbath. This Elijah is expected to herald the Messiah. And this idea of calling fire down from heaven, which we were told that the false prophet does, is something that only Elijah did. It's sort of Elijah's calling card, if you will, or at least that's what I think the false prophet will want people to believe, and I think it works. And yes, we have this whole image of the beast thing in which he causes it to give breath, and it, you know, it's all very sci-fi sounding, but the reason I'm saying this is that we know from scripture that it's this guy, this miracle working false prophet, fire down from heaven guy, that's the one that causes people to get the mark of the beast. And that's a really important thing. You have to, whatever your theories of the mark of the beast, they have to incorporate that because it's a, an explicit teaching of the Bible. The next thing I think we can know for sure about the mark of the beast is that it is a global requirement, which we get from this phrase, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave. This one is not really contested by anyone. Pretty much everyone thinks it's going to be a global thing, so we can move on. The next thing we can know is that it is a mark, which comes from the Greek word charagma, which means a stamp, an imprinted mark, such as a mark branded upon horses. It can be a thing carved, like a sculpture or a graven work. 
The face value interpretation is that it is what it is in English, a mark, though I suppose it could be a non-visible mark. Many people envision a microchip, for example. But I do think that the context demands that it is something that is physically there because of the buying and selling aspect. In other words, you need to be able to see it or check it. It also is explicitly said to be in the right hand or on the forehead. This, in my view, eliminates the view that it is a spiritual mark that one gets because they worship the Antichrist or something similar. In fact, there's a long list of, I think, false teachings that use as its basis the idea that the mark of the beast is not a real thing at all, which I obviously disagree with for the points above. I think it's important to point out that there's nothing in the text here that says this mark has to be anything more than a physical mark or tattoo or something on one's body that a person needs to show in order to buy or sell things. It certainly could be something more high tech, but there's nothing at all in this text that suggests that it will be. All that is modern interpretation and newspaper eisegesis that may or may not be true. The next point I think we can know for sure is that it will be required to be in or on the right hand or forehead. The reason there is an option could be that not everyone in the world has a right hand, but everyone has a forehead. Thus, it seems likely that the hand will be the preferred method. The next pretty clear teaching is that no one might buy or sell unless they have this mark. This is probably the most famous aspect of the Mark of the Beast, besides the number 666. And I think it means just what it says. If you don't have this mark, you won't be able to conduct commerce. This would effectively cut those who won't worship the Antichrist out of society. And it's more than just them not being able to buy or sell. This is all to facilitate this war against the saints. Remember, this is during the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist starts the greatest persecution of all time. His main goal is to kill, to war against the saints, and to slay them. This is kind of a, a method to kind of flush them out of the system and make sure that they can't, it's illegal for them to go buy food or whatever, so they are further isolated and that kind of things. It makes them easier to catch. It also has the uh, effect of making those who are sort of on the fence choose to get the mark, you know, in order to eat and feed their families and these kinds of things. So it's a carrot and the stick thing, but mainly it's to flush out those in the midst of this war on the saints. I want to mention a few things at this point, because as I said, this verse is so famous that it has spawned all kinds of spin-off doctrines that are not necessarily true. For example, the concept of a cashless society. This idea of a cashless society being associated with the mark of the beast emerged in the 70s, and to this day, I think some people genuinely believe it's what the Bible says. And let me be clear, it is possible that we will go into a digital currency system. I actually consider that likely. It seems that's where the elites are pushing us. And yes, a digital currency might make something like not being able to buy or sell without a mark easier from a bureaucratic standpoint, but it has nothing to do with what the Bible is saying here. Again, I'm not saying it's not a chip or a digital tattoo or something high tech. It very well might be, but I am kind of tired of people sending these news stories about chips or something and saying, look, the system of the mark of the beast is being developed because that's just a guess based on a major extrapolation of a very simple phrase here. Next up, we have these four concepts. It will be the name of the beast. It will be the number of a man. You need to calculate it. And that number is 666. Let's look at the number itself first, which is the number 666. That is the number that comes after 665. It's not three sixes in some combination. This is a critical, often overlooked data point that refutes a lot of theories out there. For example, some people say that every UPC code has three sixes in it, one at the beginning, one at the middle, one at the end. Well, even if that were true, which we'll see later it is not, the passage doesn't say that there will be three sixes sprinkled in amongst other numbers. It says that there will be a number 666. This also refutes other theories out there about patents for cryptocurrencies that have sixes in the number or bills in Congress that have sixes in the number. The number is 666. It's not the presence of three sixes in any combination. Related to this is the idea of calculating this number. And here I will refer you to an excellent paper published in the Conservative Theological Journal by Hal Harless entitled 666, The Beast and His Mark in Revelation 13, where he attempts to systematically answer this question. And I agree with his conclusion, namely that what is being referred to here by calculation is probably gematria. 
In Greek and Hebrew, before the use of Arabic numerals much later, letters were used for numbers. This is called gematria. And while this process became overly complex by the period of the Talmud in which seven different methods of gematria were developed, only one of those seven, the so-called ragil method, fits all the criteria laid out in this paper, such as being the one in use during the time of the writing of the Book of Revelation. Based on this paper, it seems probable that the mark will actually be written in either Hebrew or Greek letters, and it will simply be the name of the man who we call the Antichrist. In Ragil Gematria, that name will equal 666. As a side note, I should briefly mention here that there is a textual variation in which the number is recorded as 616. Irenaeus, an early church father, mentions this variation in his teaching against heresies in the early 2nd century and calls that number spurious. He points out that it was likely caused by a copyist error and that he, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John himself, knew of people that attested that the number was 666. In any case, the vast majority of manuscript traditions support 666, as do most scholars, though it is something to keep in mind. The last thing I'll mention in the fact section is related to our timeline, and it's that this Mark of the Beast event occurs after the midpoint. I put this one last because unlike the other facts, this one is not explicitly mentioned in the text. Though there are no chronological phrases in Revelation 13, that is phrases like, and then this happened, and then this other thing happened, there is a logical flow of events from verse 11 regarding the false prophet, and this aspect of the mark of the beast is the last thing mentioned in that chapter, following the section of the institution of the worship of the image of the beast. This chronology and therefore association with the mark of the beast and the worship of the Antichrist seems to be supported by the rest of the book of Revelation, in which the mark of the beast is mentioned six other times, and each of those six times it mentions the mark of the beast in association with the worship of the Antichrist, usually with the image of the beast. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sores upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. This supports the idea that the worshipping of the image of the beast mandate comes first, and then the mark, because the mark is instituted in order to mark those that worship the image of the beast. There are no scholars that I know of that think that the Antichrist demands this worship until after the abomination of desolation event at the midpoint. That's why it is an abomination, because that is when the Antichrist declares himself to be God and worthy of worship. And if the mark is about worship, then it also means the mark can't happen until all the other precursors to that event take place, such as a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and the reinstitution of the daily sacrifices, which begin exactly three and a half years before the abomination. All right, let's move on to some of the things that people propose for the Mark of the Beast, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. I should also say that I did a graphic a couple years ago about this, which is a flow chart with all this information on it, so you can determine if your theory about the Mark of the Beast is correct. You can download it in the description below. Let's start off with this UPC idea, since I have already mentioned it. The idea is that every UPC code has three sixes in it. This is because these white and black bars represent numbers, and there are these so-called guard bars, which are two thin black lines at the beginning, middle, and end of every barcode, which they say are the same thing as the bars that represent the number six. So there are, in this theory, three sixes in every single UPC code. And while this would be a bit creepy if it was true, it would not line up with what the Bible says about the number, which is explicitly that it will be the number 666, not three sixes separated by lots of numbers. But this is a myth in any case. The guard bars are two thin black lines, and the number six is two thin black lines plus a thicker white bar on either the left or right, depending on which side of the guard bar it is. So no, there are definitely not three sixes in every UPC barcode. So just spend some time learning how to read UPC barcodes. It will take you five minutes and you will immediately understand that this is not true. One theory that gained popularity after 9-11 was that the Mark of the Beast was really misunderstood by Bible translators and that it was really a picture of an Arabic phrase in the name of Allah, as well as a picture of crossed swords. This one I've done an entire debunking video on, which is unfortunately almost impossible to find on YouTube, so I will play it at the end of this video as a kind of appendix. 
The big one, of course, these days is that the mark of the beast is the COVID vaccine, or perhaps the vaccine passports. And I should say that this camp is typically divided into the sort of radical versions that say, you know, it's the mark of the beast right now, and that there is chips in it and the rest of it. And then there's those that say, no, it's not, you know, the, the mark of the beast right now, but it could be down the line with vaccine passports and other events take place, etc. It's just like the setting up of the system of the mark of the beast kind of thing. You could, for example, look at the idea that it must be on the right hand or forehead. Maybe the vaccine passports could be implemented this way. I have seen, you know, somebody injecting a chip into the right hand or whatever for a vaccine passport. So that's a possibility, but certainly not with the vaccine itself. Also, there's nothing about 666 or the number of a man's name or anything like that in the vaccine. Uh, the big one here is that it has nothing to do with the worship of the Antichrist. The point of the mark of the beast is to say that you will worship the Antichrist. Some will do this because they love him and believe his message. Some will do it to get food and to not be killed. But all of them will worship the image of the beast. It would mean that someone could hold you down and give you the mark of the beast against your will and damn you by their will, or give you the mark of the beast in your sleep and damn you to hell. So this is a choice that people will make with their eyes wide open. I know there were a lot more theories I didn't get to, but I hope that the first part of this study will help to answer some of those questions about whatever the theory may be. You can also use that uh, image that I mentioned before to check your facts about the mark of the beast. And here is the video that I mentioned, and we will see you next time. Walid Shobat, in his book, God's War on Terror, endorses a very unique approach to understanding the so-called Mark of the Beast in Revelation 13, 18. Most Bible scholars and teachers have understood the Mark of the Beast in Revelation to be the number 666. Shobat, however, proposes that John, the writer of the book of Revelation, did not intend for us to understand this mark as a number at all. Shabbat says that John was supernaturally shown the Arabic words for in the name of Allah and a picture of crossed swords when he was writing Revelation 13, 18. John then supposedly wrote down these Arabic letters and symbols just as he saw them. Later generations of scribes, however, apparently misunderstood John's intentions due to the Arabic symbols resembling the Greek letters Kai psi and sigma these scribes wrote the greek letters instead of the arabic symbols when making subsequent copies and since the greek numbering system is based on letters scholars mistakenly believe the mark of the beast to be the number 666 contextual problems i want to begin with the argument that the context of this passage does not support shubat's thesis the verse in question reads as follows here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Revelation 13, 18. Notice the words calculate and number in the above verse. These are words that are quite blatantly telling us that we are to look for a number. Because we see phrases like, it is the number of a man, and his number is, it would seem that John was well aware that he was intending the reader to understand the mark as a number. Shabbat says the following about this problem in his book, quote, Now consider the alternate translation that the Allah theory could produce. The Greek word sephizo, translated above as count, can also quite naturally mean reckon or to decide. Likewise, the Greek word arithmos, translated above as number, can also mean an indefinite number or multitude, multitude in the case of more than one, such as a multitude of people. With this in mind, consider the following translation as it makes very good sense. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding reckon or decide discern the multitude of the beast, for it is the multitude of a man, that is, Muhammad and or the Mahdi Antichrist and his multitude, are identified through the following in the name of Allah and the two swords, or jihad. Let's start with the word sefidzo, which is often translated as count or calculate. Shabbat says that the word can simply mean to discern or decide, and doesn't necessarily have to do with counting anything. Sefidzo is a very rare Greek word in the New Testament. In fact, the only other time it occurs in the Bible is in Luke 14.28, where it says, 
For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count, say Fidso, the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Here, the word is obviously used in the sense of counting. Jesus is talking about a man counting his money to see if he has enough to finish a building project. The word sefizo is never used in a general sense, as in to discern or decide or reckon. The Greek language has a much better word for that, dokimatso, which is used quite often in the Bible. And if John had meant to simply say reckon, decide, discern, in the sense that Shubat is using it, he almost certainly would have used the word dokimatso. Shubat says that the word sefizo, calculate or count, quote, can also quite naturally mean reckon or to decide. In other words, he says it can be used without reference to numbers or counting at all. I can only imagine that Shabbat looked at some Greek lexicons, like Strong's or Thayer's, and simply saw the word reckon and decide, but failed to read the full lexicon entry carefully, because these lexicons clearly define the word as related to counting something. Thayer's entry for Seifizo says, to count with pebbles, to compute, calculate, or reckon, to explain by computing, commonly and indeed chiefly in the middle in the Greek writings, to give one's vote by casting a pebble into the urn, to decide by voting. The word reckon in the lexicon entry above is expected to be understood as being synonymous with the other words in the definition, like compute and calculate. Reckon, in this case, is limited to reckoning as it relates to counting. Similarly, notice that in the discussion of how the word was used in other Greek writings, that sefizio meant to decide in the sense of deciding by voting, which is related to counting. After consulting every major Greek lexicon that I have available to me, I have not found a single one that would allow sefizio to be used in the way that Shobat uses it. If Shobat would like people to believe his translation, I would suggest that he needs to produce a Greek scholar or some very good argumentation that would be sufficient to overturn the understanding of this Greek word in the scholarly world. The word number, which is used three times in Revelation 13:18, comes from the Greek word arithmos, which is where we get the English word arithmetic. Shobat translates this word as multitude. While it is true that the word arithmos can mean multitude, it cannot be used the way that Shobat is using it. Lexicons give two possible definitions for arithmos. Number one, a fixed and definite number, and number two, an indefinite number, a multitude. The second definition is only using the word multitude in the same way that English speakers use the word number to describe an indefinite number. For example, there are a number of cats over there, or the number of homicides in the city has risen alarmingly. One way to show that Shobat's translation is not possible is to first show you that the Bible already has a word for multitude when it is used the way that Shobat is using it. The Bible uses the Greek word aklos to refer to a crowd of people, and it does so 175 times in the Bible, including four times in the book of Revelation, Revelation 7, 9, 17, 15, 19, 1, and 6. When aklos is used, it is always used to describe a group of people, never anything else, only people. So, for example, Matthew 9, 8 says, Now when the multitudes, or aklos, saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. A good way to see the difference in these two words is to try to substitute the word arithmos, or number, for aklos, or multitude, in the same verse we just got done mentioning. So, in this case, it would read, Now when the number saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. In this case, we would wonder, the number of what? It requires a subject because the second definition of arithmos simply means an indefinite number, where aklos means a group of people. That's it, only people. I again referenced every lexicon I have available to me and did not find a single one that would allow for Shabbat's interpretation of this passage. When Walid Shabbat says a Greek word, quote, can also quite naturally mean something else, 
he needs to give some significant reasons to believe him, especially considering that the reference material disagrees with him. Shobat, in an attempt to justify his translation of Revelation 13, 18, says that the Restoration Scripture's True Name edition translates the passage in an almost identical way as him. That leads us to a pretty interesting story. The Restoration Scripture's True Name edition is a translation put together by one man, a Messianic author and pastor from Florida named Moshe Kaniochowski. Kaniochowski has many sermons that preach almost verbatim the theories of Walid Shobat, including Shobat's Mark of the Beast theory. In fact, I started to expect plagiarism on the part of Shobat when reading over Kaniochowski's material, since it was written long before Shobat published his books. Then I discovered the Simon Altoff connection. Simon Altoff was a member of Kaniochowski's ministry team at one time and heavily influenced Kaniochowski's end times teachings. Walid Shobat was a good friend with Altoff in the early days of Shobat's ministry. In fact, they wrote a book together called This Is Our Eden, This Is Our End, which is now out of print. Two years before Shobat's book God's War on Terror came out, Simon Altoff wrote a book called Islam, Peace, or Beast about the Islamic Antichrist doctrine, which included the exact material on virtually every topic Shobat covers, including the Mark of the Beast material that later appeared in Shobat's book. Simon Altoff accuses Walid Shobat of plagiarizing his work in an article on his website, and the two are no longer friends. Altoff's book was published originally by Your Arms to Israel Publishing, which is Moshe Kaniachowski's ministry. Shobat has since accused both Altoff and Kaniachowski of being, quote, cult leaders, which practice polygamy and bad doctrine. And it should be noted that both Altoff and Kaniochowski do not deny that they practice polygamy and seem quite proud of that fact. So to sum up this point, Walid Shobat, in an attempt to justify his translation of Revelation 13, 18, points us to a self-published Bible, which he admits was written by a cult leader that he personally knows. In addition, Shobat himself clearly influenced the translation of Revelation 13, 18 in Kaniochowski's Bible, either directly or, if you believe Simon Altoff, Altoff influenced Kaniochowski with the exact same arguments that Shobat would later steal from Altoff. Either way, this is an absolute mess, and Shobat does not gain an ounce of credibility for his decidedly awful translation of Revelation 13.18 by citing Kaniachowski's Restoration Scripture's True Name Edition. Let's move on to examining Shobat's thesis about the Mark of the Beast from the Greek text itself. When making his case on the Mark of the Beast, Shobat puts particular emphasis on the facsimile of Codex Vaticanus that is in the library of Bob Jones University. Shobat claims that when he visited the library, he was surprised to find that he could read the 666 section of Revelation 13:18 because, quote, it was in Arabic. The following is a picture of the two relevant pictures that are typically shown to demonstrate this theory. The top image is of the Arabic words, in the name of Allah, followed by a picture of crossed swords. Remember, Arabic is written from right to left. The bottom image is from the copy of Codex Vaticanus at the Bob Jones University. There are misrepresentations in virtually every aspect of these images, but I think that the best place to start would be with regard to the history of this copy of the Codex Vaticanus and its lack of relevance to Shabbat's thesis. Throughout Shabbat's book, he continually tells his readers that the codex he saw at Bob Jones University is dated to 350 AD. This is significant because Shobat is trying to get us to believe that the earliest copies of Revelation 13:18 looked like the image he is presenting. So convincing his readers that the image he shows them is a very early copy of Revelation is paramount to his theory. The problem is that while much of the copy of Codex Vaticanus is dated to around 350 AD, the book of Revelation, where we find this verse, was not included in the original and was added by a scribe in the 15th century. 
The styles of writing between the early portions of the Codex and the Book of Revelation are vastly different. The style of the Greek text in the picture Shobat shows his readers is called minuscule, and it wasn't even invented until around the 9th century. All of the early Greek writings of the New Testament were written in a style known as unical, which looks nothing like Arabic. In the image above from the P47 fragment of Revelation, which is dated to around 250 AD, you will notice that the Chi Tsai Sigma, that is 666, look very different than the way it is presented by Shobat. The same is true with every single early copy of the book of Revelation, such as the P115 fragment, in which you can see that, for example, the sigma looks very simple, like the English letter C. All early Greek writings were written in a completely different way than in the picture Shobat shows. Remember, this is a picture which he dishonestly says was written in 350 AD, when in fact it was written over 1,000 years later in a type of Greek writing that would have been completely foreign to John or any other Greek writer at the time. As I said earlier, there are misrepresentations in virtually every aspect of Shobat's images, so I will need to take this section by section in order to debunk it. I will start with the Greek letter Chi, which Shobat says is really a picture of crossed swords. It should first be noted that there's no actual correlation with Chi, which looks like an X, to any Arabic letter or word. When Shobat says he was surprised he could read this section of Revelation 13:18, he couldn't have been referring to the letter Chi, since there is no Arabic letter equivalent to it. Instead, Shobat claims that John was shown a picture of crossed swords by God, which he says is used universally throughout the Muslim world to signify Islam. So the first thing that we must accept if we are to believe Shobat's theory is that God showed John a mixture of Arabic words as well as a picture to John. It seems more likely to me that Shabbat, when finding no way to incorporate the letter Chi into Arabic, had to resort to claiming it was a picture instead of an Arabic word. It is obvious that Shabbat would really need to emphasize the universality of the crossed swords relationship to Islam in order to make this theory coherent. But the crossed sword symbol is far from a universal symbol of Islam. In fact, most jihadist flags, banners, and badges don't contain any swords at all. Some of them have only one sword, if any. There are a few that have two crossed swords, but only an extremely small minority of those contain the words, In the name of Allah. The most common Arabic phrase on Islamic insignia is the Shahada, which says, There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God and it looks nothing like the Greek symbols for Chi, Tsai, and Sigma. One of the many reasons that Shabbat sticks to the version of Revelation 13.18 produced by this 15th century scribe is because of the way that that scribe wrote the letter Chi, which is different than other scribes. It should be noted that with Greek minuscule texts in the 15th century, it was common for scribes to have their own unique style. This particular scribe wrote the letter Chi with the flourishes on the bottom two legs of the X, which made it possible for Shabbat to claim that they were sword handles. There are two problems with this. The first is that this is how the scribe wrote the letter Chi in all the other instances of the letter in the book. See picture above. There is nothing unique about the scribe's letter Chi in Revelation 13:18 than any other instance of the letter Chi. He didn't add sword handles just to this verse, but apparently he added sword handles every time he wrote the letter. The second problem is that this scribe's particular style when writing the letter Chi, putting the flourishes on the bottom two legs, is different than other scribes of the era, see picture below, and indeed is not consistent with how the letter was written at any time, including all the earliest copies of the book of Revelation. If flourishes were to be added to Chi, even in the much later minuscule texts, they were almost always on the same line. Shabbat's theory wouldn't work with these images because that would mean that one of the swords in the picture consists of just two handles while the other is just two blades. We will keep running into reasons why Shabbat must stick to this particular 15th century scribe's version of Revelation. Let's move on to the next letter the Greek letter Tsai. 
Shabbat says that the Greek letter Psi in Revelation 13, 18 corresponds to the Arabic word for Allah. The first thing to note is that this is not how Tsai was written in John's day, nor is it the way it is written in the earliest copies of the book of Revelation. Notice that the letter is not curvy at all in the oldest copies of Revelation. Tsai was originally just three lines, but by John's day had developed into more of a jagged zigzag form. It would not be for almost another 800 years before the letter Tsai began to be written with the curvy fashion that Shabbat shows. The line above Tsai. Here again we will see an example of why Shabbat emphasizes this 15th century version of Revelation in the Codex Vaticanus above all others. Notice that the line above the letter Tsai is only above that letter in this illustration though it must be said in the actual Codex Vaticanus, the line extends just a little bit more over the other two letters, which will be important later. Also notice the flourish that the scribe adds to the line. In other manuscripts, the line extends over all the letters in the series and does not contain the flourish that we see above. As mentioned previously, the Greek alphabet doubled as the Greek numbering system. To avoid confusion, Greek writers would draw a line above the letters that were intended to be read as numbers, with the line clearly extending over all the letters and without the flourish. Shabbat's theory is wrong because in the oldest versions this looks nothing like the word for Allah when the line designating the numbers is shown in the correct way. Upside down Allah. Another thing Shabbat has to do in order to make this theory work is turn the word Allah on its side and then display its mirrored image. Here's how the word Allah is written in Arabic. And then you can see if it's turned 90 degrees and then its mirrored image. It seems very unlikely to me that God would show John the word for Allah flipped on its side and reversed. It's even harder to believe that if John saw the word for Allah right side up originally, that he would have decided to flip it around and reverse it himself. Shabbat deals with this problem by saying that in some cases, like when the word for Allah is written on a circular object, such as a coin, it can be written on its side. This may be true for circular objects, but it's not true in any other case, nor does this explain the reversal of the word. It's just as wrong for Islam to write a word on its side and reversed as it is for an English speaker to write an English word on its side and reversed. I believe that just as in the case of the crossed swords, Shabbat is doing everything he can to force Arabic words and symbols into the Greek alphabet. The Greek letter Sigma. Shabbat says that the Greek letter Sigma in Revelation 13, 18 is really the Arabic word bismi, which means in the name of. Here again, the Greek letter Sigma looks nothing like it would have in the era that the early copies of the New Testament were written. In the image above, notice the absence of the dot that appears in the image below. In the case of bismi, the dot is a very important part of the Arabic word, but is not and never has been a part of the Greek letter sigma. The dot, seen in the 15th century Greek text that Shabbat uses, was actually a period, since the chapter ends with the number 666. Punctuation marks were not even added to this text until well after the 15th century. In conclusion, we have seen that Shabbat's theory fails in several ways. His attempt to rewrite Revelation 13, 18 by explaining away the words for count and number was utterly ridiculous, defining Greek words in a way that no Greek lexicon or Bible dictionary agrees with. His pointing to Koniochowski's Restoration Scripture's True Name edition was almost funny considering that he influenced Koniochowski's translation and that Shabbat himself considers Koniochowski to be a cult leader. We also have seen that Shabbat continually misrepresents his key text of the Codex Vaticanus in the Bob Jones University Library, without which his theory cannot work, as being written in 350 AD, when in fact the section of Revelation in that book was written in the 15th century. We have seen that in order to make the Greek texts look like Arabic, he has to insert an image, cross swords, instead of letters, turn the word Allah on its side and reverse it, act as if the line that the Greeks used to designate numbers was connected only to Zai, 
pretend that a period added very recently by a scribe was in the original and is actually an Arabic symbol, and above all, act as if the Greek minuscule text was somehow known of by scribes in the first century, despite the form of writing not being invented until the ninth.